All, All right. right. So welcome to the huddle. Um, we're recording this for those of you who uh, weren't able to make it. Um, and uh, we're lucky to have Joe Ballou, who is very familiar with Vistage, speaker, member, all around sort of amazing professional, and it's going to help us get a glimpse into technology. Uh, so take it away. Oh, great. Thank you. And appreciate the kind words there. Uh, it's true. I love Vistage. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk to any Vistage member, it's going to be a good day. Uh, I just really appreciate it. And in fact, I'll be traveling tomorrow to do another Vistage group on the same topic. Uh, so I'm excited to keep sharing what I have and what I know. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a fractional chief technology officer. Uh, I help other businesses um, kind of see where the trends are going or how you can become more efficient in your own organization. Uh, two of you, Tyson and Jean, you both know me already. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm glad you're both here and I can talk to you a little bit about this. And Casey, I'm glad you could join us. Those of you that are watching a recording of this, welcome. Uh, if you have questions, please either reach out to me or Steve and then he'll get the questions to me. Uh, I don't want you to miss out on being able to get Q&A just because you weren't able to be here from the beginning of this uh, presentation. Uh, what I want to make sure we talk about is anything that's relevant to you that are here today that are joining. Um, I can sit here and go through my slide deck for the next 60 minutes or however long it may end up may being, uh, but I don't find that that's gonna be as actionable for you. You've taken the time to be here on today's call. So at any time throughout this presentation, raise your hand, say, hold on a second, Joe, I don't like that. Or that, you know, puts a bell up or anything, just let's talk about it. The more we can have a discussion, that interaction, the more takeaways you're going to get from today. And because my goal is for you to leave today's meeting going, I'm glad I joined and I wish other people joined also. Um, that's what I like to see. And the only way that that really happens is either I just know you that well and I give you information that you're needing or you're asking the questions and I can give you answers for your company or for you personally. Um, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about the business impact to technology, why we need it, uh, and then what are some trends. Take a look at those documentation and answer the who and the when as well. So not just the what and the why, but the who and the when. You have to answer all those to truly be successful in implementing technology because it's, it's easy in the 2020s to say, I need technology and implement technologies. It's a lot harder to see that return on investment that you're putting the time into. Uh, and we need to make sure we're the companies that succeed with our technology and not just implementing technology because we're trying to stay relevant. And it starts with this process. This is the process that I use uh, for any company that I'm helping. Uh, it, it's a cycle and it starts with documenting. If you don't know where you are today and you don't know what you want to be tomorrow, how can you properly implement or choose a solution? How can you know when to implement it? How can you know uh, why or who should be helping you with it uh, and to work on it? If you don't know that information up front, you're going to be setting yourself up for failure, not success. So it's critical to go through this process and starting with that documentation, ask yourself, what are my current processes or what, are, what, what does today look like for my company and what do I want tomorrow to look like? Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to clients, what I hear is I have my three to five year company outlook. And I say, that's great. I'm glad you have three to five year outlook for your company. And they say, yeah. And then I have these technology goals. I want to do this with technology. I need to update this. I need to be more efficient. I need this and I need that. I'm like, time out. Anytime you have, you're separating technology from your business, you're setting yourself up for failure. What technology should do is get you to where your company goals are. You need to make sure that you say, all right, I want to be this big in three years, or I want to be this efficient, or I want to have this much EBITDA in three years, whatever those three to five year goals are. And then you ask yourself, how can technology get you there? We can't just rely on hiring more people. Uh, we can't just rely on this best new idea coming in or that the answers will solve themselves. Or we can't do the opposite and say, this is a trend. Let's, let's jump on this bandwagon uh, without knowing, does that fit my business need? 
So everything we do in technology should be around our business strategy and bring technology in and not have two different strategies. And then from there, it's how do we get efficient in the when? And if anyone is familiar with uh, business cycle theory, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in today's presentation a little bit from now, because the when really matters. If you bring a great product at the wrong time, it's gonna feel like the wrong product. Or if you invest in software, when you're gonna be hitting an economic downturn and you're not gonna be utilizing that software, again, you used capital, you know, that capital expenditures at a time where you shouldn't have, you should have saved that cash. So knowing where you are and where your company is going to be six months, 12 months from now makes a big difference in what we can be doing with our strategies. And then we need to be agile. We can't be thinking, this is what my plan is for the next two to three years and I'm gonna stick with it. We have to be listening to what our customers are saying and our customers are both our internal employees and also our actual clients. Uh, we have to be listening to what they're saying and adjusting what we're doing and why we're doing it based upon what they're telling us. Uh, because we could have a great idea. We're not all Apple and Steve Jobs though. We're not gonna just bring out an iPhone and say, you're gonna use this iPhone and you're gonna love it. And you're gonna be inside our boundaries. That's just not how it works. Uh, we need to know what they're telling us and be able to adapt to it. So that way we keep those clients and get new market share. So start with the business impact. Uh, this is the why. Why does it matter to me as a business owner or a business leader in the company? Why should I care about it? And what are the good and the bad that come with it? And, you know, what we're gaining or what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say, okay, we want to be more efficient. We want to have a higher profits. We want increased productivity. Um, we know that we have, if I went around the room, every one of you probably has three to 10 ideas that you want to see implemented or 10, uh, three to 10 new projects, maybe it's new products, uh, whatever it may be, you have a list and we have to be able to attack those, but we can't do all 10 at the same time. So the importance of implementing technology correctly isn't just, are we successful in the one we're working on, but it also impacts the future projects that we have in place. Uh, if we're spending more money than we expected, that's less money we have for future projects. If we're taking more time to implement it, that means we're not going to see that return on investment as quickly. We may be losing out on market share, or maybe it's just we don't get to that idea number two, three, and four for that much longer. So there's a true business impact to successfully implementing technology and what we choose to do. An example of what good looks like is Chatbot Julie. Uh, it's Amtrak. Um, I don't know outside of this example if I've ever said Amtrak and had positive things to say about it, but Aunt Chatbot Julie is an example of what good looks like. Uh, they were looking at their analytics and they said, all right, we're seeing our customers go to our website. They browse and then they leave our website. Uh, and they're asking themselves, why? Why are they going there? And what they're doing is they're going there to find uh, train schedules and maybe purchase every once in a while. But oftentimes they waited to either call or to go down to Amtrak itself to purchase the tickets. And then they said, okay, well, that means people have questions. They, they're not taking the action on the website. And all of us can understand that time is money. If we're taking time to go to some website, it's because we are saying this is what's most important to us right now. But we may not get that customer to come back a second time or a third time to our website. So we need to make sure that we are keeping them on our site as long as possible and getting that result from that, them being on there. And one way of doing that is the chat bot. Uh, it's, maybe it's even more basic than that to begin with. Maybe it's just a chat client on the website. If your website doesn't have a chat client, you should really be asking yourself, why not? Why, why am I not answering my client's needs when they're on my website? You can't possibly give all the information about your company on your website, or you would inundate the potential customer with too much information. But you don't want to give so little information on that website that they say, I don't know what this website even is. I don't even know what they do. They're cool. They look creative on their website, but they're not giving me any information. So when you find that middle ground, that's great. You're now giving them and you're getting them hooked. But if they have more questions, which they probably will, you need a quick way to be able to talk to them. And by using a chat client, one person can talk to the many. If it's an email, you might lose them for X number of days before they respond. And you don't want that. You want immediate connection with that customer. So, and if it's a phone call, it's a one-to-one. -one. And not everyone wants a phone call. I don't do phone calls if at all possible. 
Uh, when I make a phone call, I'm assuming they're going to try and sell me on something. And I don't want to be sold. I want the information. I want facts so I can decide. And that's why people love chat clients. But then you take it that next step. And that's what Amtrak did. They said, let's do a chat bot. Let's make it so that when they're talking on the chat client, it's not always a person they're talking to because the frequently asked questions can easily be automated. And any one of us today on this call or watching the recording, you can create a chatbot, very simplistic, easy to implement in an agile approach, which means instead of saying, what are the thousand different ways that I can make this chatbot work? Or what are the hundred top questions that are asked? It's what are the five top questions? Put those in there. And then as more come in and the person is working them, they're going to say, oh, these are more frequently asked ones. And you start building on top of that. And before you know it, you're going to have an advanced uh, chat client that can answer most of those questions for your clients. And that's what Amtrak did. And you can see the numbers here, a 800% return on investment, 30% revenue generation because of chatbot Julie. You know, it's something so simple as let's put chat client on our website that generated more revenue, more sales, and more profit. So ask yourself, am I using a chat client? And if not, why am I not? Uh, and should I be? And you don't just go down trends to go down trends, but you really should be asking yourself because in today's market, I don't see any, I don't see too many websites that for a reason not to have that chat client on there. The next is Kmart. For every positive, there's Kmart. <laughs> and I apologize if anyone's worked at Kmart or loves Kmart. But when I say, when I'm going to talk about something that may be a negative and I say Kmart, that makes more sense. People are like, okay, yeah, I get that one. Uh, and that, let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, oftentimes when I'm talking to our cl my clients or you know, I'm speaking out there on the road, it's everyone loves to collect data. We're in the age of big data. Uh, we're as much information as possible. But when I ask the question, why are you collecting that? Are you using that information? Most times I hear, I may in the future need that information, or I'm not sure why I've always been doing that, or that's how it was done before I got here. Those are different words that I've heard that are very similar. And that's what Kmart did. Kmart said, okay, I identified a problem. I documented, they did the right first step. And they said, my issue is I don't either have enough inventory or I have too much inventory at my local stores. So they custom built software. And that's a great thing that people love to do. They love, companies love to build custom software because it's built to my needs. It's specific to my company. It does the best thing for me. Uh, but what they did was they spent $1.4 billion to build this custom software. So that way the, ship it, the shipping industry would know when to send the inventory, when they need to order inventory and how to get it there, when to get it to them. But day one of launching the software, they realized how they needed to make some changes. And the custom software was so customized, they had to spend another $600 million to custom fix the software that they realized it wasn't worth it. And they scrapped the whole project. So they spent $2 billion on custom software because it was too customized, they couldn't use it. Am I saying custom software is the wrong answer every time? No, I'm not saying that. But all I'm saying is be careful when we're using software, because once we open that Pandora's box, once we start saying we can do things the way we want, we need to be careful and ask ourselves why, what's the benefit? What is it? What are we actually getting from it? Uh, really start to look at that third party software or what we call SaaS software uh, in the customer relationship management world. That's something like a HubSpot or Salesforce in your ERP world. We have your oracles and other products out there, you know, Look to what they are doing. They're your industry leaders. They actually, they probably know 90% of what needs to be collected for information. And if you can't fit inside that box, ask yourself, maybe I need to be doing something differently, or maybe I'm collecting too much information or the wrong information and start to adjust. And then if you realize that there is that 10% that they're missing out on, you can custom build a 10% add-on instead of a whole solution. But let's not get caught up in that Kmart trap where we say, let's go build our own software. Instead, let's look to see what's out there and see how we can fit into their playground as much as possible. And I, I like to ask the question, are you behind the IT curve? Uh, do you know what your customers are saying? You know, do you know what their wants are? Do they like the user experience? Are there improvements that they would like to see? 
Uh, do they like how the interactions are? Uh, maybe it's the billing. Uh, do they prefer the billing method that they're getting from you or the form of communication they're, that you're talking with them? Uh, you need to know these things to be able to understand that, you know, how can I keep that retention? If they enjoy talking with you, if they enjoy the interaction, they're going to be like, more likely to keep you as uh, working with them. But the last one on here is the one that I really like to talk about, and that's disruptive technology. How can we be Netflix? How can we be the disruptors and not the blockbusters of the world? Uh, it doesn't always work, but is there something that's sitting on your mind that's like, I really think this could be something. I really think this could change the industry. Why not act on it? Why not at least look into it, research it, start to um, go down that path? Maybe it becomes too expensive. Maybe we don't do it right now, but it's an option for us. Uh, you know, Netflix did that. They came out with DVDs, Blockbuster matched. They came out with digital content or streaming content. Others then started to do that. Then Netflix came out with their own content. Others are now matching it. Then they went overseas and now others are starting to get there also. But it's always Netflix first and they're always gaining that market share up until this last quarter that was really rough for them. But prior to that, they've been that industry leader. They're they're just seen the same way as an Apple, but I actually believe Netflix is a much bigger disruptive technology company than Apple is. Apple, in my opinion, just does things and they say, this is what you're going to enjoy. And because they have the name behind it, people follow, but they're not as much of a disruptor as uh, Netflix would be. So what's out there that could be for your company? What's, what's something that you've been thinking about that you could jump on and start to research that and ask yourself, does that fit into my three to five year outlook for my company? And just know that it takes time. It's not an overnight process. Uh, if, you if you're looking at this trend, if this technology, you want to make the, you want to jump in the deep end with this product change, that's great. But try not to think I'm going to go in on it. I'm going to spend all this money and six months later, or maybe two months later, I'm going to see that return on investment. Technology changes take time if you're going to implement it correctly. And my example here is American Airlines in the U.S. Airways merger. You can see that the merger was announced in 2013, but it wasn't until the end of 2018 that all systems were merged. And that was considered successful. It went really, really well. And white papers were published because of how well that merger went. So it's not all about how much money you can throw at it. Sometimes it's about identifying, planning, and executing over time. So keep that in mind as we're looking at our technology and strategies. So let's take a look at the current IT landscape. Uh, starting with uh, distributed workforce or working from home, uh, I'm not gonna go through everything you have listed here. You can see some advantages of it. If, if your companies don't operate in the DWF world, that's fine. Uh, you know, we see some post COVID that are now bringing their companies back. Others are going to a hybrid approach. If you're in the hybrid approach or you're in the fully remote um, realm, use technology to your advantage. You, in, one of the things I hear about, well, when we're remote, we were losing our company culture. Uh, I hear culture, 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 or I miss that water cooler talk. Use technology to your advantage. Set up those meetings appropriately. Get the HR involved and say, how can we implement a hybrid model? And it starts with making sure that you have the right number of screens. We provide monitors in the office and standing desks, keyboards. Why don't we provide those at our house? So we need to do that same setup in the home as we do in the office. You know, cameras on all the time. There's no reason for a camera to be off unless you're not feeling well uh, or something's going on that day. But as a general rule, if you keep your camera on, you can have that connection. Maybe start meetings with talking to each other about how their families are, or their friends or their interests. You know, we need to be able to keep our employees engaged at work and uh, and to keep them from feeling like an ant or just a busybody, the way you do that is to connect with them on a personal level. We do that in the office around that water cooler. Why can't we do that before or at the end of meetings or have special meetings just to talk to each other? It takes company time and it's more energy from your managers, but that culture will go a long way. And that all starts around that technology and how to use it. But when we're looking at actual industry trends, uh, let's start with customer service. It, it, the year 2022, and it started with 2020 when uh, more and more of the workforce uh, stopped working uh, due to COVID and then government intervention. Uh, it's tough to get great health these days. 
and it's expensive to get uh, more labor uh, add to your body count. So how, what's, what do we do? Well, we either pay to get those people in or we use technology to offset the need for uh, that growth in the company. Um, so that's what we're looking at is how can we use technology to become more efficient and to offset that labor count? And it starts with a great example in customer service. Uh, what we're trying to do is say, as business grows, we don't need to grow our labor count the same. Instead, let's use software that's out there, that third-party software like I've mentioned before. Uh, in the customer service world, it'd be HubSpot, Salesforce, those kind of um, areas. But, you know, Gene, for you, I know we've looked at software that could help offset that as well. Uh, so that way you can do more with your, your existing labor uh, to be able to track it. Those are the types of examples that we're looking at. You know, in the marketing world, it's how can we use automation to be able to do more with the existing market team? So when you use technology, it says, okay, instead of having to manually send out all these emails, let's use automation. Let's use AI to send out those emails. We can say, when we send out an email, change the email depending on who it's going to or what region or what, uh, if they're Gen X versus baby boomer versus millennial, we can say when those emails go out based upon who they are or where they are in the country. You know, what used to be required marketing to look at analytics and determine what we're going to do, we can start to do things in bulk. And that allows us to say, we only need one marketing person to do the work of what used to be five people, or maybe we only need two instead of 10. That's where you start to get that scalability and you got, start to see that profit increase that can self-fund some of these uh, investments that we're doing. Um, and the same goes with the sales team. Instead of them saying, sending out the same emails every time we get a new lead, we can automate that. Or maybe they respond to that email we can now have a workflow built that says, based upon their response, send these canned emails or maybe notify us in certain instances, but other times do X, Y, or Z. You know, that's ways that we can say, let's use our teams for the best of their abilities. Our greatest assets are our employees, but let's, let them, let's use technology to be more efficient and for automation so that way we can let our employees be the um, use their skill sets to their best abilities at that higher level instead of the routine, that day-to-day. -day. That routine day-to-day -day is a great area to look at on how to automate and how to become more efficient. How do we eliminate that from their use? So I, I like to ask my employees or my clients, what are they doing? You know, write down on a day-to-day -day what typically you do. And then we start to circle. That can be automated. That can be eliminated because that's not needed. That's a redundancy. And we start to go through the process and see how we can clean up what they're doing. And by cleaning that up, either through technology or waste, we now say you have more time available. So as our business is growing, we don't need to hire another person. We now have that uh, avail the available time from our existing workforce. That is scalable. That's profit right there. Another option or another trend we're seeing is in the audio and visual search function. Uh, if you're sitting in your car and you're driving and we've all been told now, no, you know, we can't touch our phone. It has to be hands-free. So we say Siri, send this text or Siri, play this song. That's your audio search. Can that apply to you? Do you have an app? If you have an app, how can you integrate audio search for your company? Uh, it really comes down to your industry and who your clients are. They may not need an app. And if they don't need an app, you don't need audio search. But if you have an app or you should be getting an app, then ask yourself, how can I integrate that? Because that is one of the largest areas we're seeing for growth in the next five years is getting audio search because we're so used to now texting or audio um, speech to text uh, for our texting, for phone calls, for our voicemails to be read to us, uh, you know, all those different areas, reminders. It's just commonplace to talk to your phone now that we need to be able to integrate that also. We don't want to have to have the client open our app to, to think about us. We want us to always be front of center, front of mind. Visual search is a harder one, but there's some key people that can use it. Visual search is I take a picture and it searches for what I'm looking at or gives me information on that. You know, if you're in those industries that's booming for industrial transportation and um, construction, uh, and then personal use, visual search, those are great areas for it. 
If you're in economics, there's not going to be a great need for visual search. So it's knowing about who you are, not just the industry trend. Um, Internet of Things goes really well with the everything as a service and machine learning. Internet, Internet of Things is a way for us to be able to collect information and have it compiled in one spot so we can start to see what's happening. In a transportation industry, what that could look like is where the trucks are going, how they're, um, are, and then we can start to use that to, with the machine learning to say, are we routing them the best way possible? If we're not routing them the best way, we can optimize that through AI to be able to say, this would be a better route, or let's switch these uh, days of when deliveries are done. It's using information, the information you're collecting from your devices along with an actionable decision, usually through machine learning or AI, that really start to see that benefit, that gains, and be able to do more with who you have and what you have. But Internet of Things can also be used for uh, tracking downtime. And on an industry uh, plant floor, uh, if an IoT device can be tracking, hey, it's pushed through X number of products, we know typically at that number of products, if we're going to start to see failure we can schedule downtime. Scheduling downtime is uh, so much more cost efficient than having an unscheduled outage on the factory floor. Uh, so how can we use that IoT for us? You know, in the medical world, the Internet of Things may be your watch. If you have a smartwatch, uh, we can connect that up to your doctor. So I think when you go back to your doctor, if they're using that technology, they can say, hey, I saw your average heart rate was this. Um, you know, or your blood pressure was this, your breathing was this, and they can start to get that information instead of having you give them that. And they can start to collect it and know how to take actionable decisions and, uh, with you and through you. So IoT is used all over. It's just how can it be used in your industry? Uh, and that really makes a difference is most industries you can use Internet of Things, those devices to track, to understand, to gather information. But we don't want to just implement that and then let it sit there and say, oh, yeah, I'm tracking this package. I know when it gets to my warehouse. I know how long it sits in my warehouse. I know how long it takes to leave my warehouse or it takes in processing. You know, IoT will track all that for you. But if you're not making decisions or not changing what you're doing because of it, you're now investing in technology, but you're not going to get the benefit of it. It's what you do with that information that really matters. So don't collect the information if you're not going to take that next step and make decisions and changes because of it. Uh, everything as a service is going down that path of non-customization. It's instead of me having to bring in a development team to build software or to be AI, the artificial intelligence for my industry, because I know that I could automate and with some machine learning and AI, I could you know maybe grow twice the size of my company or lay off a third of who my company and let computers do it because it's uh, pretty basic once they start to learn it, we're not going to want to bring in people to pay to make that automation and that AI. That's not cost effective. Uh, hiring engineers that are machine learning experts is not something that most businesses want to even venture down. That we're not Google, we're not Apple, Tesla, we're not going to hire those uh, very smart, sophisticated engineers. But what we can do is when we're using third-party software like an Oracle, or maybe it's your um, warehouse software or your HubSpots out there, your Salesforce software, they also have AI built into it because they're paying people to build that AI and they're just offsetting a fraction of the cost onto us through those licensing. We can now start to take advantage of AI without having to pay that full price. And we need to, you know, if we have these softwares that offer uh, machine learning and predictions and allow for that scalability and we're not using it, we're not leveraging our software the way we should be. So you should, I really recommend taking a look at what softwares do I currently have and am I using those softwares to the fullest extent or am I paying for something I'm not using? And if you're paying for, for something that you're not using fully, why not? Should you scale back, bring your cost down or do you need to take the time to look into how can I use everything I'm paying for so that way I can get more from my software because it's that more from my software that's going to see that profit increase. I do have some industry specifics on here. I don't believe we have anyone in construction and installation, uh, but I'll pause on here for a second in case if 
when the recording is sent out, if you're in the construction installation world, take a look. These are your hot topics. If you're not working on these individual ones here, you're falling behind the industry. And when you're going to start to be working with millennials and someday Gen Zs, ask yourself, are they going to want this technology front and center, or are they going to want to work with someone that doesn't have that technology? You know, that, that alone is a reason we don't want to fall behind. We want to be in front of our customers, not behind our future generations. Next one is transportation and warehouse. That one does fit more with who we are here today. Uh, embrace the fourth industrial revolution. You know, understand we need technology. We have to accept the necessary evil and start to go in that world. Uh, you know, what software is out there for us? How can we adopt the latest logistics and supply chain software and then start to utilize that predictive index, that um, AI, that artificial intelligence, the internet of things. So that way we can start to gather that information and make decisions off of it. And then we can use that for routing of trucks and inventory systems. Uh, we can either go down the path where we have always been doing, and we can hire more people as we grow our business, or we can start to adopt these technologies, the software to truly uh, be able to revolutionize the way we see our boxes and see what inventory we have to know where it's going, when it needs to be there, and be able to pre-plan and have the computer do that pre-planning for us to, in the optimal um, path. And it will learn and it will grow and it will understand what I'm doing and make it better. And over time, it'll become more and more efficient without us having to touch it. And that's one of the benefits of AI and machine learning is we're not gonna have to correct it. It will self-correct and improve over time. Knowing your customer is important. <clears throat> that goes back to the, the trends. We don't want to implement trends that don't help our customers. We're not here to say, this is what we're going to do. Come to us if you want this. Don't come to us otherwise. It's better for us to say, we know who our clients are. We know where our bread and butter is, for a better, lack of a better word. So how do we go into their playground? How do we offer them what they're looking for? Uh, one an example I have is I work with this one client where we would send out an email with an Excel spreadsheet. And we, we asked them, please fill out the spreadsheet and get it back to us. Well, we were finding through our analytics that uh, customer relationship management software of HubSpot that we would see 80% of people would open that email. I mean, that is a great open rate, being able to say, I'm going to send this out to 1,000 people. 80% of them are going to open up that Excel attachment. But what we also saw was of that 80%, almost 75% of those 80% we're opening it up on a smart device, whether it was an Android or iPhone. And I don't know about you, but I do not like opening up Excel sheets on my phone. It is not a great experience. And completing an Excel spreadsheet with data sounds even worse. And then having to attach it back to an email and send it back to the person that sent it to me is not an experience that we want. So what we saw is although 80% were opening it, only about 30% were actually filling it out. And that's because of the 80% that were opening it, we would then see another 40% opening it at a later time on their desktop. So what we were forcing our customers to do was to, yes, I understand they're looking at it on their phones first because most people look on their phones first, but we're saying, I know you're on your phone, but we're going to make you go to your computer to do this. And because of that, we had a low success rate. So what we did is we said, nope, we're going to ditch Excel. We're going to create a web app form that they can fill out. So now we're sending them sending them the email, they're opening it up. The browser mobile app uh, is rendered for them on their size phone that they have. It's a much better user experience. And we saw that completion rate of filling out that form go way up. And the time that people had to open up the email a second time went way down. Those are both great experiences for us as a customer or as a, the company. So we benefited from it as a company because we got the information faster and from more people. The client benefited from it because we went into a format that they wanted. So how can we do that for our customers? Do we, are we collecting that information? Do we know that the way that they want to communicate or what they like or don't like about us? And can we make those changes for them? And then let's go into a little bit about the actual individual uh, Generations. We have four here on the screen that are predominant in the workforce. Uh, you know, Gen Zs are coming into the workforce. They're on the younger side of it, but they're there. Uh, and they all interact differently. 
you know, if I were to send a blog to a millennial or a Gen Z, they're not going to read it or they're going to skim read it. That's not their method of communication. They, they don't prefer email. They don't prefer blogs. They prefer vlogs or podcasts or direct messaging like text messaging or on social media. So knowing who our, gener you know, what generation is our target market can really help, you know, define how we communicate with them. And what I will hear on occasion is, but I'm not business to customer, I'm B2B. Uh, but we have to understand we are all B2C in the 2022s. If I am going to interact, you know, Tyson, if you're going to talk to, try and reach out to me, uh, it's me you're talking to. You're not talking to strategic. You're talking to me individually. And if you know I don't like phone calls, but you're going to keep calling me, I'm going to keep hitting that ignore button. But if you send me an email or text me, especially a text, I'm going to respond immediately. I respond to my text immediately. So how you interact with that client is going, can, can help you reach that client and help you keep that client because they enjoy that interaction. So knowing that we are all truly B2C can really help change the way we think, but it goes to the next step is know what age your average person is that you're talking to. You know, if you're talking to mostly the VP of that company and that VP of that company is typically age range of 40 to 60, um, then you know, okay, or maybe it's 50 to 60 or 40 to 50, you know, okay, I know they're mostly Gen X or, but they're soon going to be millennials. So I know that I'm targeting the Gen X really well, but millennials think differently. So am I ready for those millennials? Because if my, if my company is ready for millennials before my competition, that's more market share I'm going to get that my competition is not going to get because I'm ready for them. So it's not just knowing who your current generation is, but it's knowing what your next generation likes and doesn't like and how soon are they to be your client. So that way you're ready for them before they're your client. It makes a big difference. You know, Gen Zs, they were born with a phone in their hand. Uh, from day one, they expect technology. Every other generation appreciates technology. Gen Zs expect it. So when we're, if we're working with Gen Zs, are we handling that properly? It can't just be, oh, this is cool that they're now doing this technology. They're going to look at it and say, wow, this is sloppy technology, or this is not a good UI UX, uh, the user experience, the user interface, the look, the feel of it. So when you start to shift from late millennials to, or, or early millennials to late millennials, they're going to start to feel that way. And when you get to Gen Z, that's 100% of the way that they're going to be thinking. So be prepared for that. We can't just have technology. We have to be doing it correctly. And it has to look good and feel correct. They're not going to be as willing to uh, accept that the emails didn't go through or that we sent sloppy emails or that the website is down again. That's, you know, they're used to your big companies uh, servicing all of their needs on their phones. And that's the main way they, they talk is through phones. So are you rendering your website or maybe you're sending DocuSigns? Is it built for a phone? Is your website built for a phone? Or if it's the... If you're giving them a portal to the inventory system at your warehouse, is that built for a phone? Because that's where they're going to be looking first. You know, even millennials, we're going to be very much tablet and phone first, laptop second. Uh, I know I'm on my phone more than I'm on my laptop. Odds are I'm responding to an email on my phone. And only if the email is big enough or complex enough, am I going to switch to my laptop to send out an email? So, you know, how are we interacting with the clients? And are we on their terms or are we making them come to our platforms? The more we can go to their platform, preferred platforms, the more they're going to talk to us and stay with us. And that's where we start to form that business strategy. We've documented, we've started to understand these are the trends that we're going to go down toward. This is what the path we want to take. Lean Six Sigma, we're not going to get into today. But what that truly means is just identify your waste. Build out your processes in a swim lane. You know, have a diagram of flowing through what are all your steps from the time it, you get your client to the time you deliver the product, whatever that product may be, physical or digital. And then ask yourself, are there any steps in there that are redundant? Are there any steps in there that are just from the past? And um, what I like to ask is, why do you do every one of those steps? And if I hear it, because I've always done it that way, I immediately ask, well, what would happen if I took that out? And then we start to poke at that and see how we can become more efficient. 
More efficient means we can do more with the same amount of people. More efficient means we get that product out faster and we can uh, recognize that revenue sooner. You know, we all wanna be more efficient with what we have. So from there, let's talk about the business cycle. And I mentioned it a little bit. It's, uh, if you uh, can start to track the when, it can make a big difference. A lot of us are gonna to start to feel a recession coming in 2023s. Uh, you know, if I have two products, one that's a great moneymaker, it is my top product, I know I wanna bring this to market, but it's also more expensive. And I have this other idea that says, eh, it's not as good of an idea. It's not, as, it's not gonna make a lot of money because it's too cheap. Maybe that's the one you go with because of the recession. If you were to bring out this big product that costs a lot of money, at the time when all of your clients don't have the cash to spend, is that really the right product at the right time? Or was bringing out the less, you know, grand idea, it's not going to give us 30% increase in revenue, but maybe it gave you that 10%. Did that all of a sudden, that 10% start to help offset your recession? You know, are we still keeping clients? So that way, when we get through the other side of the recession, they're going to be part of us and maybe then they build onto that bigger platform of yours. You know, so how can we look at the when? Uh, when we're looking at a list of all the ideas that we have, identify what makes sense in the economic cycle. But you don't want to plan for your economic cycle you're in right now. It's where are you going to be next? You Right now is planning for the next. We don't always act on the now. That's reactive, not proactive. And what that can really look like is we have our economic cycle here. If we're in a recession, that would mean let's take a look at how our numbers were October of 2021 versus October of 2022, are, is revenue down or is it up? Is bookings, you know, shipments, units, whatever format you're tracking, are we higher or lower on a month to month rate this year compared to last year, same time? And if you do that over a couple of months, what you might find is, all right, in September, I maybe I was down 3% and in October, or October I'm down 10% and in November, I'm down 12%. That means you're in the downward decline here. And you see that blue line and then where the red arrow is, that means you're headed down towards that trough. You're still in that recession. Things are worse than they were last year. Recovery is that next phase, that phase A as we call it. And that's where you've hit the rock bottom and your numbers are still worse than they were a year ago, month to month, but they're improving. So maybe instead of a negative 12%, it goes back to negative 10, negative eight, negative seven. You're starting to see, okay, the worst is behind me. I'm still bleeding money, but not at the same rate as I was the prior month or prior couple months. Growth is where we all wanna be. You know, That's where we're gaining business. Our revenues are up year over year, month over month. We all wanna have that uh, forecast that's linear, that just says we're always gonna be in that growth phase. This is where things feel good. This is where we're gonna spend our money and we're gonna invest in the future. Slowing growth is in yellow for caution. Uh, it's phase C for caution because slowing growth is still where you're making money. Slowing growth is still where you are increasing year over year, but at a slower rate. So that's where your warning sign comes in that maybe recession is over the horizon here. You know, maybe you slip back down into a soft landing and you go right back up into growth. But normally what will happen is you're going to go slowing growth to recession. So if you can identify that, yes, my business is growing, but it's growing slower, that can be a, a caution for you on where to spend that money. And that's where a lot of us are today in the, in the United States, maybe not in Arizona or Southern Arizona or for your industry, but as a whole in the United States, a lot of us are in that slowing growth. And some of the management objectives we need to take away from slowing growth is we're still bringing in more cash um, month over month, year over year than we were before. You know, our cash is increasing. So we have the ability to spend money. It's what we're spending the money on makes a difference. In slowing growth, I, I would be preparing for a recession. And what, what that looks like is maybe uh, we're gonna have to let people go. And if we have to let people go, then we need technology to offset that. So how can we bring on new technology or improve our existing technology to offset when we have to let people go? So that way, what business we do have, we can do with less people. Maybe it's um, getting ready for those long-term contracts, renegotiating them. Or when you're signing a new contract, identify, okay, I know a recession's coming. I need a plan for that. 
but it's looking at your capital expenditures and start to say, I need to stop investing in the future. I need to stop investing in that great idea that's really expensive and start planning for the immediate future of the recession. When you're in the recession, now you don't have as much money, but you have the time. So when you're in the recession is how can I use my, uh, the time to my advantage? And that would be getting, uh, planning, preparing, looking at your processes. How can I become more efficient? So that way I can do more with who I have. So again, uh, you know, in today's world, maybe it's I need to do more with who I have because I can't get more employees. But in a recession, it's going to be more of I don't want as many employees or maybe I'm trying to keep the existing count, but no more for future growth you're gonna use that time that they have to be able to identify ways to clean up your processes and start planning for the future. It's all about what you're currently doing, how to make it better and planning for that future. Planning, 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 which goes into recovery. Again, you don't have the cash because you're still year over year worse than you were a year ago, just not as awful as you were. That's hope is on the horizon. But with that, it's all about timing. In the recovery phase, timing is key. If we think back to 2008, 2009, with a great recession that we felt across America, if someone were to say to you, uh, Gene, Tyson, Casey, in 2009, we're gonna be out of this recession, you're gonna have a booming business. Wouldn't it have been great to use 08 in the beginning of 09 to start planning on what my business should look like when it's booming? On that way, I can say, these are the technologies I want to have in place. I know I'm going to have to hire 20 people. So let me get the tra uh, training materials in place when I have the time. So that way, when I hire them, they can hit the ground running day one, being a benefit to the company and not having to do that training cycle. And I can time that, or maybe it's bringing in new software. I can plan that new software. And at the end of the recovery, even though we're losing money, I can start to spend a little bit of that cash. So that way, when we hit recovery and our clients are spending money, we're there day one saying, hey, I'm over here. I'm ready for you. And my business is ready for you. Whereas most people don't spend the cash until they have the cash. They don't spend the cash until they feel that the business has taken that turn. But if we can trust our economic advisors to say, you know, this is where the uh, economy is going to be and plan for that, plan your technology for that, we can be ready for it before our competition. Now, that makes a big difference. That's another way to get market share. And then the growth, that's where we all want to be. Growth phase is where you feel good. That's where uh, our money is coming in, business, new business, revenue, year over year is up. We use that opportunity to embrace technology. Maybe it was an expensive platform that we just didn't imagine ourselves being able to afford or that we couldn't afford before. Now we can. Profits are up. Revenue is up. Cash is coming in. Take advantage of that. Invest in uh, disruptive technologies. Be that disruptive force in your industry because you have the cash to be able to do that. You know when slowing growth is coming. You planned for the recession already. You're now in growth. You have that capital. Start spending it on technology. You know, bring in more tech so you don't have to bring in as many people. And that way, as you're growing, you can keep your labor count the same while seeing profits increase. This is a quick overview of where a lot of the industry is. If it's in yellow, it's because it's that caution, it's that slowing growth. I don't know if you track well to any of these. I just wanted to provide some of, a little bit of an economic outlook. Uh, a, a lot of people track well with gross domestic product, GDP, or the US industrial production, which is how the industries, you know, the industrial side of America is doing. Uh, both are in slowing growth and are gonna be hitting recession here in 2023. So if you track well with the, you know, the average consumer uh, or the industrial side of America, be prepared. It's, you know, we're going to be in recession here soon. Uh, if you track well with consumer spending or oil and gas production, you're feeling great right now. You know, you're in the growth phase and that's a great industry to try and go after right now is that, you know, whoever's involved in consumer price index or in consumer spending, you want to be like, I want to go to those companies because they're going to have the money to give to me uh, to be able to grow my business and you know be there. Um, and maybe that helps offset your other businesses, uh, clients that are in those slowing growths. So that way you can see some revenue you know, balance out as you're going into that recession. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be an economist. I don't want to tell you where you match up 
but I do encourage you reach out to an economic firm. Uh, I know Vistage is close to a couple of them and we'll send out articles. Uh, you know, so when Steve sends those out, read them, read what those economists have to say, where we're going, not just now, but in the future. So that way you can start planning your future and when to do things. Ask yourself these questions. Uh, are you, do you have a CRM, that customer relationship management software? Are you able to take advantage to do more with your sales team, to do more with your marketing team and your customer care team? You know, in that CRM is where you're gonna have that chat bot, that chat client, automation, workflows, to be able to scale your business. As your revenue is increasing, your business is increasing, you can use that to be able to keep your labor count the same. And are, do you know where your trends are in your industry? We talked about some of them today. There are many more out there though that are industry specific. If you don't know your trends, talk to me. I'll look, I'll research it for you and find your trends. Um, but you need to know, you know, your competitor is probably looking into it also or is already doing it. Uh, and we don't wanna be left behind. We wanna be on the forefront of technology. In the 2020s, as millennials are taking over and Gen Zs are right behind them, we can't afford not to be leaders in the digital age. We, we, it's just where we have to be uh, for any business. And what is that great idea that you're sitting on that we haven't acted on yet? Maybe it's time to start acting on that. And don't forget about cybersecurity. I have whole presentations on cybersecurity. Uh, I just cut it out of today's uh, so that way we could keep it to that 60 to 90 minute. But if you have any questions on it, please, if you have a cyber team, talk to them, make sure it's, you know, um, question them. You know, if you have a cyber team right now, provide an audit on them, make sure that they're doing, you know, keep them accountable, make sure they're doing what they're, you're paying them to do. Don't just trust that they're doing it because the worst thing that could happen is you, you're paying someone, they say that they're, they're protecting you, you get attacked, your systems go down and then you say, okay, get them back up. And they say, oh, I didn't have a backup or, oh, I actually wasn't planning on that. I wasn't prepared for this, or I don't know how to do that. Um, that's why you need to audit. You need to make sure you're, you're getting what you're paying for because it's easy for third-party companies to say they'll provide something. They can prove it when it comes to cybersecurity. Don't just trust them. It's trust, but verify at a minimum. And the who makes a difference. Uh, when you're a smaller company, mid, small to mid-sized business, you know, maybe it's a $5 million company, maybe you're a $100 million company or $200 million company. We typically have multiple roles that we fill in that company. And technology is no different. Oftentimes I hear the head of uh, sales, head of marketing, head of accounting, maybe it's the CEO, they're running the technology shop. I really recommend against that. You know, I don't go to my doctor to get advice on my car. I go to my car mechanic to get advice on the car. So identify why did I hire this person and are they the right person for the role? You know, I, I wouldn't uh, hire an accountant to be leading my effort on the assembly line. Uh, so why do we accept that with technology so quickly? We're so quick to just hand technology off to somebody and say, you take care of it. They need to have a seat at the table in today's environment. We are all moving towards that digital age, the digitalization of our companies uh, by it's now 2022, almost 2023. We should all be thinking that way. A technology expert needs to have a seat at the table at the executive level in your company. But not every company needs a full-time one. You know, that's where companies like me or others, uh, that fractional approach come in. We're there to help you sit at the table with you, walk you through it. But I do promise you, if you were to bring in a fractional CTO, CIO, at some point, whether it's two years, three years, four years, five years, you are going to hire that person away from the company and have them be a full-time employee at your company because you're gonna realize the benefit that they offer and you're gonna to start to see that high revenue and the profits will increase and you'll be able to afford that person full-time. So maybe a full-time is not right for you at the beginning, but at some point in time, they will be a full-time employee for you and you're never gonna look back. You're gonna you're going be preaching to everyone else. You don't have a CTO, wow, you need to get one. In the world of digitalization, why don't you have that person on your team? So let's, I wanna end on this slide, my takeaways. Uh, you can't cheat when you have your takeaways, don't take my takeaways, take your own. Uh, but here are what I think are some really leading points, some top takeaways from the presentation today that 
would certainly be my aha moments that I could take away from here. Um, I hope you do also. Uh, you've all, you've been quiet. Uh, maybe I'm talking too fast for you to be, feel like you can raise your hand. Uh, I would love to open it up to questions or maybe if you wanna share what one of your takeaways are, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I, it looks like we have about 20 minutes, so we have plenty of time if anyone wants to share their thoughts or questions. Um, otherwise, Steve, you get some time back. So let's just throw it open to the group. Uh, questions from anybody and no need to raise hands, just speak up. Tyson, you're up. So uh, the question that I had sort of written down to ask Joe, and I don't know whether you feel comfortable answering this, but um, we have implemented chatbots for several of our clients. And, you know, we've had mixed results with them. And I wondered if you had favorites, at least for web usage. My favorites are the ones that interact with their customer relationship management software or CRM. Uh, okay. So if they have a Salesforce or a HubSpot, which are your generic CRMs, or if you're in construction, uh, they have specific CRMs for them. I like to use those that interact, that integrate with them because they can take that information and tie it directly into the CRM. You know, it adds that person as a as a contact that can then start to be nurtured uh, as long as you're following proper laws, depending on where you are in the country. And then from there, you're starting to nurture them and you're gonna start to grow and you can do proactive contacting them without involving a person Again, it's that automation, that sending out emails, that nurturing. And when they get hooked and they respond back, that's when your sales representative steps in. Okay. Helpful. Others, Casey? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about the chatbot thing and, and about what questions. Um, so it's, you know, we're mostly restaurants. So I was trying to think of how a chatbot could be helpful for the restaurants. And the, the phone calls that we get most of the time are about, re are about reservations that we don't generally accept unless it's a group of 10 or more. So I was thinking about the chat bot and the chat client. Um, if you had one person that was uh, responding to multiple people and the thing that they really want access to is a calendar, um, is that something where you just try to set up a whole, whole lot of rules about how that, that um, chat client could set up the the booking or is it more about just trying to talk to the person and then direct them um, to get a call back or something like that do you I don't know if I gave you enough information to kind of work with there I believe you did uh, okay. what I'd be doing that, going down that path is great first of all that you have identified why they call most often and from there in my chat bot what I would be asking is how can I help you they're going to say, I'd like to make a reservation. I need more information about a reservation. I would respond back with, you know, great, glad to help. How many are in your party? And then if they say under 10, it's one response. If it's over 10, it's another type of a response. And you start okay. to ask those questions to know what calendar to give them or what response to give them. Uh, but the idea is you're trying to hook them there, no matter what the answers are. So that way they don't have to end up calling because I don't want to go through six questions just to find out that I still have to call. And I don't want to go through six questions to find out that I can't be helped at all. So it's as quickly as possible, you want to get them the answer, but get them the right answer means you have to ask the right questions first. Right. Yeah, actually, that, that was, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, gonna Casey, say I'm sorry, please continue. No, 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 go for it, Tyson. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I, I'm I'm with you, uh, Joe, like I, I hate when I go through all the little dog and pony show, the flaming rings, only to find out I don't get a treat at the end of all that, <laughs> right? So, so honestly, like if I'm like, and then this has happened to me, not with Casey's restaurants, but with other restaurants, I'm trying to make a reservation. Oh, you don't take reservations, okay? So my next thing is, well, okay, how can I game the system? You know, when, when are they less crowded? You know, well, well, how can I maximize the purpose of my wanting a reservation without a reservation? And then my, my thinking starts along those lines. I know Southwest Airlines did something similar where you used to have to like guess and check based on your dates. Right. Oh, but you have flexible dates. So now you can look at entire calendars where the wall affairs that gives the information the person would have wanted once they can't get the date that they wanted, right? So it's kind of similar, just figuring out what people are thinking and what they actually want to know. 
Yeah. And I've seen that with so 